I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. The Victorians laid the foundations of our modern cities, but they also created prison as we know it. Strangeways, Pentonville, Wormwood Scrubs, Dartmoor and countless other prisons were built in the 19th century. I cannot begin to imagine what the conditions were like. Just like prisons today, this monumental institution dealt with everyone from violent offenders. He was obviously a, a hooligan. And with a vicious temper. Yeah. To white collar fraudsters. It's a bit of a tacky crime, really, isn't it? It's a bit like sort of tax dodging. He's just been siphoning away money. I'm a bit embarrassed about him at the moment. And petty thieves, drunks and vagrants. The Victorians revolutionised the penal system with discipline, hard labour and isolation. So that's what they wore? That's what they wore. Well, yes, you can't see anything to the left. You can just see straight forward. But alongside this new regime were older punishments, like public hangings. To know that a member of my family was sentenced to hanging, age 14. God, it's grim. Now reporter Daisy McAndrew, comedian Johnny Vegas, and actress Michelle Collins learn just how rough this justice could be. He's basically trying to make a living. It's just so unfair, it's so unjust. And broadcaster Mariella Frostrop and entertainer Len Goodman discover how their family members coped on the inside. I'm going to be interested to see how tough and how hard life in prison 150 years ago really was. There are currently over 85,000 people locked up in Britain today. But 200 years ago, most criminals were either hanged or transported overseas. At the start of the 19th century, jails contained fewer than 10,000 prisoners. But these numbers would increase exponentially during Victoria's reign. A new culture of incarceration was emerging. More and more criminals were being given custodial sentences. One such case was Philip Haynes, four times great-grandfather of comedian, actor and proud northerner Johnny Vegas. I'm very respectful of the law. I'm, I'm pretty afraid if I've had any brushes with the law. It is probably on a drunken... Disorderly level. Johnny's ancestor got into trouble in the 1830s, the decade Victoria came to the throne. Let's have a look. Um, this is taken from the Bristol Mercury and Bristol. Now that's amazing. I, 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 I thought I was pure blue blood northern. We're southern. <laughs> I'm going to have to pack up our belongings. They're going to take my settling season ticket off me. Where is Philip? Ah, we go. Philip Haynes for stealing money from W. M. Lasbury. The romantic bit of me would love to think he went out and stole money to provide for his family or something that, that could be justified. I really hope it wasn't just that he was a he was a wrong one or a bit of a scallywag. Thirty-four-year-old Philip 
was prosecuted for stealing money and a knife worth about a week's wages. Petty theft was the most common offence in the 19th century, making up 75% of all crime. Johnny wants to find out what punishment was given. We do have some records with us here um, that relate to Philip Haynes and his family. So this is the Quarter Sessions docket book. The Quarter Sessions court dealt with pretty much the majority of the crimes that were committed during the 19th century. And what we've got in here is it tells us exactly what his sentence was. Oh, I mean, oh yeah, Philip Haynes. So he was found guilty, ordered to be imprisoned in the common jail. Hard labour for six calendar months. I thought he got kind of an easy stretch, so he did hard labour. In the early 19th century, it was believed criminals had to be shown the value of working for a living. Prisoners could earn money for all rope by picking oakum or pulling apart tarred rope. But as the century progressed, attitudes changed and hard labor became something to punish and break a prisoner's will. Generally, it was activities that served no real purpose. One of the things they'd be faced with was a device called the crank. As the name suggests, it was simply a handle that they turned, basically a sort of paddle that moved um, through a drum that was contained gravel. They had to meet a certain number of cranks per day to receive their rations or food. The crank could be tightened and made harder to turn by the prison warders, which resulted in their nickname, screws. Another equally pointless device was the treadmill. Although occasionally this was used to grind flour, most often it was walked just for punishment and was loathed by the prisoners. Quite soul destroying that, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? That sort Very of labor, so. that pointless labor. It really was hard. And that was, yeah, and that's six months for basically a week's wage. Like all petty criminals, Philip served his sentence at a local jail. But in the early Victorian era, there was a massive drive to build centrally run convict prisons to house serious offenders. Although violent crime wasn't as common as people thought, the Victorian press overreported and sensationalized violence, just like today's media. In the 1850s and early 1860s, there were panics about muggings, even though the actual numbers were tiny. The newspapers loved to report a scandalous case of assault, which is why Len Goodman's family made headlines in 1862. Henry Blackhall, late of the parish of Bethnal Green, oh, come on, unlawfully, maliciously, and feloniously did wound the said James Blackhall. Oh, bly. With intent to do some grievous bodily harm, GBH, or oh, all. Oh. So Henry, the son, has bashed his dad. Len's great-great-grandfather, James Blackhall, was assaulted by his own son, Henry, and had to testify against him at one of the most famous criminal courts in the world, the Old Bailey. What I have here is a copy of uh, the court record right. of the particular case. James Blackhall I am a labourer of 12 Crispin Street, Bethnal Green. I am sorry to say that I am the prisoner's father. On the 15th of December, he came into my sitting room. My wife and daughter were present. I asked him what he wanted. He said, you old whatever, I will knock your brains out. He went into the back garden and came back armed with this pickaxe handle and swore he would bash my brains out. He got me down and struck me on the head with it, saying, I will kill you. I will knock your brains out. I will be hung at Newgate for you and your daughter. 
Right. His mother stated that he had also assaulted her and left her on the floor for dead several times. Well, basically, they're what we would call today a dysfunctional family, I would say. Looks a bit that way, yeah. it has, doesn't it? What is interesting, though, if I could take that from you, yeah. is the way it was reported in the Times. Now, this is December the 19th, 1862. Oh, you've got value for money with the papers in these days, haven't you? The well, jury at once found the prisoner guilty. The common sergeant, briefly commenting upon the brutal character of his offence, sentenced him to five years penal servitude. The prisoner no sooner heard the sentence than he turned round and made a most determined attempt to do some injury to the warder. So when he got the news that he was getting five years, he went mad again and had started to attack the, 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 uh, the warders, or I guess, you know, the, the security. Yes. Yeah. He was obviously a, a hooligan, basically. Yes. He, well, it would appear so. It would appear and, so. And out of control mm -hmm. and with a vicious temper. I think really, you know, I think Henry got his just desserts. I think he did, yes. You know, he was a, not a very pleasant person. Found guilty at the Old Bailey, Henry was taken straight down to the cells. Well, a far cry from what we see nowadays in, in prisons. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. It was, it's amazing how small it, you know, absolutely tiny, really. Thoroughly depressing yes. and basic. You were given an hour of exercise per day in a very small and enclosed space of the exercise yard. Life here was extremely grim. Mm. It's one of the worst prisons yeah. uh, ever. Newgate was Britain's most notorious prison. It was also the site of London's gallows. Had he actually carried out his threat yes. of murder, yeah. uh, he would have passed down here in a slightly different capacity. He'd have been led down here Oh, my God, yeah. And this was the long walk. It was Dead Man's Walk. Dead Man's Walk. Yeah. Oh, I can you imagine? This is your last walk of your, of your, of your entire life. Yeah. It's down there oh, towards the hangman. And I suppose there was a racket going on outside, so you started to hear the crowd, you know, laughing and joking and, and waiting. And you probably had other prisoners, you know, banging on there and yeah. the, who weren't. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a big occasion. Yeah. Executions were still held in public in Victorian Britain. They were a source of entertainment and often attracted thousands of spectators. The travel agency, Thomas Cook, even ran excursion trains to the events, treating them as pure tourist attractions. And when England's last fully public hanging took place in 1868, it's thought many onlookers had travelled to Newgate by tube. When you see that, it, it makes you realise that's going to be the final war. Yeah. You, you can't come back from something like that. No. At least Henry, you know, after his five years, hopefully, you know, I would learnt have. the follies of his ways and uh, trod tro the straight and narrow. The Victorian era was a time of great exploration, scientific innovation and industry. Britain became the workshop of the world. Capitalism and entrepreneurial spirit was championed. But these new ways of making money created new kinds of crimes, embezzlement and fraud. This is how journalist and broadcaster Mariella Frostrop's great-great-grandfather, William Martin Eckersley, fell foul of the law in 1876. It's a bit of a tacky crime, really, isn't it? It's a bit like sort of tax dodging. He's just been siphoning away money. I'm a bit embarrassed about him at the moment, but I'm hoping to find redeeming, <laughs> redeeming features in this ancestor. Eckersley was part of a new breed of Victorian entrepreneurs trying to make money off the newly emerging industries of steel, railways and shipbuilding 
in the boom town that was Barrow-in-Furness in northwest England. Eckersley set himself up as a salesman and an accountant. But when the economy crashed in the 1870s, he went bust. With no social security, Mariella's great-great-grandfather tried to use his wits to save his family from poverty and ruin. Instead, 30-year-old William wound up in Lancaster Castle Jail, waiting to be tried for defrauding his creditors. We've been able to find out what happened in terms of the trial here in Lancaster from two local newspapers. It's telling us that William has got his chum to rent a house to siphon off his property. So this is the stuff that he's removed, I presume, and they're saying that they chiefly contained wearing apparel, but there were also window curtains, blankets, sheets, towels, and counterpanes. The valuation of the goods amounted to 49 pounds, one shilling and three pence. The prisoner has a family of six or seven children. And one box was almost exclusively full of children's clothes. Well, it's hardly a terrible crime, is it? Well, let's think about it. He's allowed to remove from his estate up to 10 pounds of property. But in fact, what he's done, he's stashed away 49 pounds worth oh, of property. Yes, but of, of which, property which, is not which, cash, which, is which it? Is, which is probably the equivalent of, of about 2,000 pounds today. So he stashed away rather more than he was entitled to. But the newspaper reports reveal another side to the story. The prisoner had a fit of paralysis Oh my goodness, which entirely prostrated him and rendered his removal into courts impracticable. Just look at how just... anxious that means he is. Absolutely. I mean, look at the state of the poor man. Paralysis. I mean, that's just terrible. The jury, after consulting with each other some time, re returned a verdict of guilty. The prisoner was then sentenced to six months' imprisonment without hard labour. I wouldn't have said he was capable of hard labour as he was paralysed and carried out of court, evidently in great... Agony. ..of mind of body, and body. Of body and mind. Poor man. Yes? Terrible. My fear is that he's a goner. He's paralysed at the age of 30. He's in jail for three months, which won't improve his health. And his family are going to be struggling outside of jail. He's struggling in jail. I'm not sure there's going to be a happy ending here. By the mid-19th century, there were two prison systems. Local prisons for petty offenders serving short sentences and convict prisons for serious criminals. For assaulting his father, Len Goodman's ancestor Henry was sentenced to five years penal servitude. I think he was a cocky little devil and he'd probably be saying to the others, oh, I don't care what they throw at me. I'm, I'm going to be interested to see now how tough and how hard life in prison 150 years ago really was. Len wants to find out about the Victorian prison system, so he's meeting Professor of Criminology Barry Godfrey. He ends up doing his first stretch in Pentonville because that's where he's going to spend nine months in the separate stage of his confinement. So he's it's solitary confinement, basically, is it? Or more or less? It's, it's pretty much solitary confinement. Um, I've got a picture here. These are oh. actually prisoners that are exercising at Pentonville. Oh, my good Lord. And they've got these weird hats on with the, the peak over their faces. I can show you one of those. Oh, yeah. That is horrible. May I try it on? You can, yeah. So that gives you a sense of what it's like. Well, yes, you can't see anything to no. the left. You can just see straight, straight forward. And no one can see you, so yeah. no one knows who's behind that mask. 
and 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 and, and, and what, what was the purpose of that? Was it a pan, you know another form of punishment, or was it so that you couldn't wave? Oh, hello, John. How are you? Yeah, it's a kind of sensory deprivation, is what they're after here. Yeah. So that you spend the whole of your time thinking about what you did wrong, yeah. meditating on how you can turn your life around and reform. Prisoners were not allowed any form of human contact. They spent most of their days working alone in their cells. The only voice they were allowed to hear was that of the prison chaplain. So this is the chapel at Pentonville. Each prisoner is led down a corridor from his cell into this little box here so that he still can't see any other prisoner. And this is the religious instruction, reading passages from the Bible or mm. Ten Commandments, things like that. And that is the only form of um, communication that's allowed in the, in the uh, separate system. It's absolutely... Uh, it's a horrific, really, you know. It's astounding. Henry survives it, but lots of prisoners actually went insane and they just couldn't take it. Yeah. I would, I think. Mm. Solitary confinement now is a, the absolute last resort yep. for the most ardent, yep. horrible criminals. Yep. Yep. And, and, but that, that was run of the mill in those days. I mean, can you imagine being in this environment for nine months? Nine months, that is a long time yeah. to be kept apart from any other human contact. Yeah. That breaks them. Yeah. That breaks them and that leaves them mouldable then for the prison system. What the Victorians said was they were grinding men good, grinding them right. into good people but they're grinding them down. Victorian prisons used institutionalised psychological abuse. Many prisoners lost their minds and attempted suicide. The system was designed to strike fear into the heart of even hardened criminals to stop them re-offending. But most prisoners, like Johnny's ancestor Philip, were driven to crime by misfortune. Personally, th th this is something that it was an opportunist crime to provide, but it must have been tough. There must have been a lot of people in there who weren't essentially criminals. Yeah, and certainly not hardened criminals. I think in Philip's case, um, the fact that we can't find any further records of him being in trouble would suggest that it did rehabilitate him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or he didn't need rehabilitation. If it was just something, if it was Precisely. a moment of madness. Yeah. OK. Yeah. The family were living in one of the poorest parts of Bristol, making it almost impossible to avoid a life of crime. But it wasn't Philip that next got into trouble, but his wife, Anne. She, she scrolled oh, away at the, yeah, bottom, yeah, the bottom yeah, of the sorry, page. Sorry, yeah, it's a slightly, slightly different spelling of the surname, but it's She's the same been case. convicted. Right. Forgive me now, because I've come here to shed more light on it, and suddenly I've had, I've got a four times great grandfather who was imprisoned, and Anne um, has been convicted of a crime, and I'd love to know what she was convicted of. I can't figure out who's the villain of the piece, maybe neither of them. In the 19th century, just as today, the media stereotyped offenders. While we have outrage over benefit cheats, the Victorians stigmatised the poor and held wayward women in particular disdain. Historian David Taylor shows Johnny Vegas how his ancestor Anne was demonised by the press. I have a, a document here which will give you some idea of what Anne was getting up to. Police intelligence. Anne Haynes, a notorious drunkard, who has been repeatedly before the bench on charges of drunkenness, and who has spent a great part of her time in jail. So she was a woman. I'm afraid so. This is uh, not the first time. This is what, June 30th, 1855. Anne Haynes, an inveterate drunkard. So I don't know where I get it from now, don't I? What's this about? And then I'm afraid that... Police intelligence again. And two years later, Anne Haynes, 
a notorious old offender who only came out of jail on Tuesday was charged with being drunk and disorderly and assaulting PC 213. Practically got out of jail and just gone straight out and got hammered again, yep. isn't it? The newspapers reported Anne going to jail over a hundred times. 1861, March 25th, just unbelievable. Anne Haynes once more. Yes. Anne Haynes, a most notorious female drunkard, was brought up charged with being drunk and incapable in Frogmore Street this morning. The bench said they would give her one more chance and they therefore discharged her. Prisoner, who was at least 50 years of age, left the court skipping like a young girl. And upon reaching the door, she turned round, made a low curtsy, and once again called for a blessing upon their worships. She's a, she's a, she's a female Johnny Vegas with her attitude in the court. You know what I mean? She has got, she's got a, a rum she's, sense of humour, ab but absolutely. But she's but not... obviously a damaged yeah yes. individual. The hard thing is, I, I, I feel like I really get her within alcohol and within my mm. career and everything. I, this is somebody who nobody has ever really sat her down and said, what's wrong? Yeah. Drunkenness was the most common criminal offence during this period and was seen as a massive social problem. What is striking is that while we would say that this is a symptom of deeper problems yeah. for the Victorians. Drink is at the root of crime, fecklessness, laziness. But it's one thing for a man to get drunk and providing you're not too obstreperous, you know, go home, it's not a great problem. But women, you know, the woman is supposed to be the angel of the heart, yeah. you know, the moral centre of the family. So you're almost condemned twice. It's a yeah. criminal offence, but you're not fulfilling your role as the, the, the moral core of the family. If I'd read this about my granddad, it would be like, oh, he's a bit of a character. Yes. Yeah. And the awful thing I'm as guilty of it is I'm reading it and going, well, what about the kids? Yeah, yeah. What about the children? What about the family? Yeah. The Victorians worried about the growing problem of female binge drinkers. By 1895, 1,000 women were admitted to prisons in Britain each week. Two thirds were charged with drink related offences or prostitution, and nearly all received short sentences. Long sentences were kept for more serious violent criminals. After being broken down by nine months of solitary confinement at Pentonville, convicts like Len's ancestor Henry were put to work for the benefit of the nation. He's onto the proper convict prisons at Chatham, where he'll be helping to build the naval fortifications. And then he's on to Portland, where he gets a different form of hard labor, just as grueling and just as much a part of the punishment. Yeah but not in a separate system. The prisoners in Portland were put to work in the quarries and came back at the end of each day to a prison built from the same stone. These days, HMP Portland is a young offenders institute with TVs and central heating. But in Henry's day, things were very different. You've got to think about the environment inside the prison as well. So if he does get wet outside, he's coming back to a stone cold cell. Yeah. The bunk with a flat, very thin mattress to lie on. You have a little um, bowl as your sink, that's it. You have a slopping out bucket. And, and uh, what sort of food would they be getting? Would it, you know, would it... They have to feed you enough to enable a body to carry out this hard labor. But breakfast would be skilly, which is oats, water and Indian meal. Uh, it's so horrible that some of the prisoners don't even eat it, you know. And then uh, they would have some stale bread, some potatoes and some meat every other day. And that was it? Yeah, this is a form of almost scientific starvation. It's just enough to keep them alive. Some convicts went to extreme lengths to get a break from the hardship of prison life. Desperate prisoners would resort to eating soap, ground glass and even poisonous insects to induce sickness 
and get taken to the prison infirmary. But prison doctors were adept at spotting fakers. And as a 30-year-old man with paralysis, Mariella's ancestor would have come under close scrutiny by medics at Lancaster Castle. William was here in 1876. Yes. And this was built in 1872, so it's not important. So it would have been quite question. new. Yeah. It's amazing. It looks like a movie set for a prison. It's so recognisable, you know, the long rows of cells, the, the walkways, the... Oh, it's a bit depressing, isn't it, really? Would it have been desperately uncomfortable? I mean, I'm thinking of him now. He's paralysed. He's had a stroke. He's bedridden. Well, he was in prison at a time when there was a great drive towards, in the mid-Victorian pe period, towards making prisons a real deterrent. You can see um, you know, dismal, this is a, a typical cell of the, uh, of the time. No uh, drainage, no, no sanitation, a bucket, and they would slop out uh, each day. The windows were very small. They kept people alone for long periods. They gave them hard labour. Here, it was shot drill, and this is a, a shot. It's a cannonball, and I've got some... Um, images here of um, shot drill and what you had to do was you were taken out into the prison yard and you picked it up and then you walked to the other side of the prison yard and you put it down, you didn't drop it, you put it down, you bent your back, put it down, turned round, picked it up, walked to the other side, put it down and you did that for hours on end. That is one of the most ludicrous punishments I think I've ever seen and also, you know, completely randomly cruel for no purpose. I mean... <laughs> By the late 1870s, the Victorian prison system was in full swing. Even local jails were now under control of the Home Office, and the first commissioner of prisons, Sir Edmund Duquesne, wanted the harsh penal regime to realise its full punitive potential. So we're on the first floor now. The cell's identical to the ones downstairs. Yeah, grim. Yeah. And they've gone to great trouble to make them yes. dark and dingy, haven't they? I mean, so someone's obviously sat down and said, oh, I know what we'll do, we'll make the cells really dark. That is exactly what happened. Really? They, did. they sat down and they worked it out, yeah, about the cells, about the diet, about, about the heart the of the, the labour, yeah, and, and, and they made it as bad as they possibly could. So it was yeah. a conscious decision. Yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. And misguided, perhaps. I mean, of course, there were murderers and, you know, all of that. But a lot of people who were in jail were there just because of, you know, there being no safety net for uh, poverty. In fact, the poor were actively punished. Ever since the Elizabethan era, vagrants and beggars could be thrown into the House of Correction and forced to work. Shepton Mallet Prison in Somerset had been built as a House of Correction in 1625. It was Britain's oldest working prison until it finally shut its gates in 2013. John is visiting because in 1867, his ancestor Anne served time here for being drunk and incapable. I've made a career and been lauded for sending up what was a desperately sort of sad outcome for Anne, you know what I mean? She was actually living it, I've made a joke of it. But um, she is fundamentally institutionalised. With a system that doesn't know how to cope with somebody, with the obvious social dysfunction that Anne had. It's, it's, it's just... Uh, like I say, it's very hard when you, when you, you can't envisage a, a Disney ending for this. This is a first. Just as today, most women in prison in the 19th century were petty offenders trapped in a vicious cycle of deprivation, addiction, and crime. Like Johnny's alcoholic ancestor, Anne Haynes, many women were imprisoned repeatedly. Anne herself effectively served a life term in short sentences. 
Johnny wants to find out what prison would have been like for Anne, so he's meeting historian Helen Johnston. This is the female wing of Shepton Mallet Prison. It's pretty miserable. Like all prisons, I suppose, as it's designed to be, it's imposing, and should have known so much of this. When Anne came here, she would have experienced quite a, quite a harsh regime. Um, and because she was a short sentence prisoner, she would have had quite a low diet of um, bread, gruel, um, certain types of hard labor for long periods during the day. For men, hard labor was designed to instill the discipline needed for working in the new industrialized world. But women were expected to be domestic goddesses, so their work involved cooking, sewing, or doing laundry. Perhaps these documents will help shed a little bit more light on Anne's experiences. So yeah, Anne Haynes, age 65, drunk again and guilty of indecent behavior at Wells on the 6th of August, 1867. Another short-term sentence yep. of, of, of seven days. Unfortunately, with Anna, I mean, she's 65 now. There's been a good 20-odd years of constantly being in and out of prison. Well, if we look at this second document, she was released... On the 13th of August, and she's back in on the 14th. Yeah. What were they doing? Were they waiting for her when she came out? She clearly doesn't have, have any other means of subsistence or anywhere to go, so she stayed in this particular area and been found then, sleeping okay. in the open air. The 1824 Vagrancy Act had made sleeping rough a criminal offence. This law has never been repealed and in recent years has been used by the police to sweep the homeless off the streets. Anne was trapped by a system that punished her for being poor. It's a system that doesn't work, isn't working for her, but then she's got absolutely nothing to lose. Yeah. Perversely, she probably, coming in here, she got some shelter, and, and as bad yeah. as the conditions were, yeah. she got fed. Yeah. And she, she, had, yeah, uh, she had a roof over, over her head. head. She, yeah. yeah. What a life when, no matter how harsh they're trying to make it, yeah. that is still, you know what I mean, one up from, from sleeping yeah. rough. Yeah. This document might help to explain how Anne's life became so difficult. Oh, gosh. So, Philip Dart. I thought she'd just abandoned him. Well, they had nothing to start with, you know what I mean? He went yeah. to, uh, he was done for petty. He thought, oh, God, he just never had a life to start with. And spiralled into this particular cycle of kind of drunkenness and vagrancy. It seems to have been triggered after. After his death, his yeah. Death. So it's basically that, isn't it? She's lost her husband and then turned to, turned to just drink in her grief. It just breaks your heart to think she might have been fundamentally grieving for 20, mm. yeah, no, 20, 20 years. Is it wrong to feel better that there's some justification for her behaviour, even though it's, it's the fact that she's lost her husband? For the poorest of the poor, prison was almost a sanctuary. But for white-collar workers like Mariella's ancestor, the same conditions would have felt like hell. Paralyzed and unable to move, William Martin Eckersley was stuck in a cell 24-7 for months. And this is where he spent how long? Well, um, I have a document that might help you out then, and you, hopefully that will enlighten you. Oh, well, here he William is. is. William Martin Eckersley has been reprieved uh, because of bad health. Yeah. Oh, dear. Well, that's not great. Have they sent him home to die? Well, really, what you can see here is probably expediency 
over leniency because he, he's still paralyzed. He's in a very poor state of health. Mm. We would have required looking after. Yeah. And think. they didn't have him, they didn't want to have to have the hassle of that, I presume. That's very so bad. He's clearly not getting any better. No. Prisoners received no support on release, but within five years, William had turned his life around. This is a census return from 1881, and here he is, William M. Eckersley. And does it list a profession? He's a, he's a what? Is he an officer? A school board officer. A school board officer. He's amazing. Yes, he's doing rather well now. I mean, he's managed to take himself from criminality to the height of respectability. Yes. Yeah. What a character. And it would seem no more problems with the law after that brush at 30. So perhaps the old Victorian prison system did have an impact. <sighs> yes, it was, uh, it clearly had a profound effect on him. Good on you, William Martin Eckersley. Just four months in prison reformed Mariella's great-great-grandfather. But for violent offenders like Len's ancestor, the sentence was much more severe. Well, there it is. That, that's where Henry spent about four years of his life. And you know, when I, when I think of, of what he had to go through and how he was treated, I'm starting to think the crime didn't fit punishment, really. It just makes me feel so sad for him. And OK, he lost his temper and what he did was terrible. But we all have that trait in us. And I just hope, fingers crossed, that Henry come good in the end. At least as a first-time offender, Henry had a chance to turn his life around. But Johnny's ancestor, Anne Haynes, never broke the spiral of poverty, drink, and prison. Johnny wants to find out whether Philip and Anne's children escaped this life of crime and punishment. Your direct ancestress, um, Mary Ann Haynes, she actually married here in Bristol three months before her father, Philip, died. And I've been able to track them down in the 1851 census. Okay. Can you find them? They're, they're here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, maybe Anne. Now, do you see where they're living? Leeds? Yes. Wow, so that was a big, that, was a, that would have been a big move out it of the area. It was a huge move for them. Um, here's Richard, her husband, and do you see what he's doing? He's a glass blower. I take it that would have been a good profession, that would have been... Yes, he was a skilled workman. Mary Ann sort of married well. She has, she? she has, and this is the beginning of a completely different life from yeah. the one that her own mother had. I was dreading you sort of telling me that this had been passed on. They moved away from the unemployment, from the inner city poverty, and they forged a new life for themselves. Thirty years later, the 1881 census, Look where they're living. Oh, <laughs> ah, St. Helens. St. Helens. So that's how we got here. Wow. And this is the family? There you go. Everson. Now the pennies just dropped. My mum, I've heard my mum speak about the Everson. Yes. They're her ancestors. So she's 53 and. Well, it's lovely when you consider where, where Anne was at that age. Yes. You know what I mean? Where, where her, her mother was. Yes. Oh, God love her for getting out. Sadly, Anne's criminal record was not unusual. Forty years into Victoria's reign, there were more habitual offenders than first-time offenders. It was only by moving away that Mary Anne escaped the vicious cycle of poverty and prison her mother Anne had been trapped in. The next time I go out on stage, I'll go out there for Dan oh, and give him some welly. <laughs> but then when I go home and took my son in, do you know what I mean? It'll be... 
You'll be Mary Ann. <laughs> a little bit of Mary Ann. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Next time, Len Goodman continues to discover the full draconian force of the Victorian penal system. Ah, oh, he's a st stupid boy. So he's done something and they've stuck him back in. It looks like they've stuck him back in again, yeah. Actress Michelle Collins unearths the archaic injustice of debtors' prisons. You do your time in a prison and then you suddenly come out and it's it's almost just as bad as it is it could possibly be. And reporter Daisy McAndrew finds out how transportation transformed her ancestor from teenage tearaway to celebrated Australian businesswoman. It's something that I can tell my daughter about and say, look what Mary did. There are no boundaries in your life. There is nothing you can't overcome. It's fantastic. <laughs>